Martinez, thank you so much for uh, having us today, in Portland, Oregon, at the Hallowed Halls. And uh, it's such a treat to be in front of what uh, Guitar Player Magazine 1987 Readers Poll. So it was the top three session musicians right behind Steve Lukather and Larry Carlton. This is amazing. Thank you again for uh, just inviting us to uh, to talk to you today about your career as a session musician, as a touring musician, and as a solo artist. Thank you. It's great to be. Good to see you, man. Yeah. It's been a minute. It's been ten, 10 years. years. Ten years. Yeah, it's been and, ten years uh, since we've seen each other. Yeah, good to see you, and thanks so much for flying up, man. I'm so happy to be here. Actually, you know, it's really cool. Absolutely you know, privileged, and you know, gosh, I mean, when I think about just what you mentioned there, being you know included with those two cats, man, are just giants in my book, so. Well, um, I, I think we're gonna get to explain to people who are watching this a whole lot more of, of why you're in just such a distinguished group of people in, in just your musical accomplishments, whether we're talking about your work with Run DMC, Tina Turner, Robert Palmer, uh, just the Joe Cocker, Mick Jagger, David Lee Roth, it's like, it's just these icons after icons after icons, and you've been a part of the music, you've been a part of the, the session community in, in sort of a dissimilar community to a lot of the people that we normally mm -hmm. interview, which are more LA based. You yeah. are a New York based session yes. musician primarily from yeah. throughout your career. And so we're gonna get to hear, I think a lot about how that worked, your, your work on a lot of these hit songs. And I, I don't really wanna waste any time to get into some of the amazing guitar playing that you did. I think we can probably safely say for most people that are familiar with you and your work, they probably most closely associate you with Robert Palmer. Would you would you characterize that as as the artist that you're most closely associated yeah, with? Yeah, I, I think that's really accurate because um, I played on hit records before I worked with Robert, but I, I believe that my work with Robert really kind of was the moment for me that it kind of I created my identity within the context of his music. Yeah. And I was to I was able to like really apply things that I was hearing because working with Robert was just a wonderful collaboration with, yeah. with him and, and Bernard uh, Edwards on that first album, and Jason Corsaro as well who engineered that uh, and recorded everything mm. and then subsequently E T that mixed it right. and uh, just a great it was a great experience. It was great. So, so the the two songs I want to focus on for Robert Palmer is Addicted to Love and Simply Irresistible. And I think we should start first with Addicted to Love going chronologically. That was mm -hmm. 1985 you had recorded yeah. it? Yeah, we recorded that. I think it was around November of 85, right around Thanksgiving. Okay. Because we were in the Bahamas in Nassau. That's okay. where Robert lived. Okay. And uh, we went down there and uh, I think a few days of like pre-production and listening to the tracks. And yeah. then we went in to Compass Point and recorded that. And and it was, it was just awesome working with Robert and Bernard. It was really an, an interesting... Uh, collaboration. Uh, anything about the Addicted to Love session, uh, and that was on Riptide, it was the album. Yeah, yeah Riptide. It, what do you remember about that particular song, like how evolved it was when you had gotten into the studio? Like what, what do you remember about it? Well, I remember Robert telling me that he dreamt the song, number one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he woke up in the middle, middle of the night, you know, you know, and just the lyrics popped out. Mm -hmm. And he had a rough demo of it. And we listened to that and then we put our, our you know, our thing on it, mm -hmm. you know, because I think part of being a session player is, is, um, is more than your proficiency on the instrument is what, what you hear and uh, what you can contribute in serving the song. Yeah. And as far as your guitar sound, what were sort of the, the components of what made that up? Because it's, it's a nice, you had a beautiful distortion sound. There's like a clean guitar in there. Yeah. Tell us about the the gear that was used to create that sound. Well, that uh, I had my uh, half a, had a fifty watt Marshall, okay, uh, non master that mm -hmm. I bought brand new in nineteen seventy seven. Okay. Holy shit, <laughs> I was two at the time, you know. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I remember buying that at Manny's. Actually, it had Jim Marshall's name written in pencil on the inside of the. Wow. Yeah, and I, I got a chance to tell him that, but um, that. Uh, single 4x12 with 25 watt uh, greenbacks in it. Okay. And it was up in uh, what was considered the the, the live chamber mm -hmm. at Compass Point, which, which was like up a flight. Okay. And uh, it wasn't really a big chamber. It was a small, actually probably about the size of this room. Okay. But uh, Jason had put a lot of close mics on it. And that was the fundamental sound for the rhythm thing. Okay. And then for the solo thing, we did it, we cut it, Jason and I were in the studio alone and we did it 
at midnight, you mm-hmm. know, because we just worked on the sound. And Jason had an idea. He liked the, he liked liked the width mm-hmm. of the of the Marshall, but he felt for the solo it, it needed a bit of, of a point to it. Mm-hmm. So what he did, he out of these blankets, he created like almost like a volcano, mm-hmm. you know, and he put a Fostex. Uh, um, remember the Fostex yeah. things from way back in the '80s? So he put one of those in there, wow. right? And then he, I think he dropped the 57 right at, at the at the at the, like the apex at the point, of yeah, it. the apex of it. <laughs> oh my God! And uh, that was the point for the solo. Wow! And uh, so we, we had a you know he took a feed off of the Marshall uh-huh. and threw that. So he combined both those elements together. And, and then I've had a Proco Rat that I uh, had one of the big box ones yeah. I bought in L.A. Yeah. like way back. And uh, no that was LED. Yeah, 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 no <laughs> LED. And that was the fundamental for a lot of that Riptide album. Wow. And then for the clean guitar, was that just like another layer that was just added after? Like, there's a beautiful part in that song where um, where you go to the the F sharp. Yeah, um, yeah. And- there was an interesting story with that. At that point, we had moved to the studio. Studio B, which had a really funky MCI board that was cross talk and all sorts of funky stuff uh-huh. happening. And Jason said, oh, Guys, give me, you know, give me a minute. I need to figure out how to record some of these clean sounds, especially like uh, the middle section on, on, on Addicted and Didn't Mean to Turn You On and, yeah. and all that stuff. So, what he did was he bypassed the board. And at that time, Robert had a, um, a Sony a Beta F1, mm-hmm. which was a digital recorder. Mm-hmm. So, he bypassed the board and used. Uh, um, I think we had a DI, maybe it was a, I think it was a DI with a Tokai exciter pedal, Okay. right? DI into the F1 on input and straight onto the, the, the so there's no machine. modulation or anything on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. There's, I think there's, um, there's a chorus pedal. So it's, there was a chorus as well as the exciter on that. Do you remember what chorus pedal was? Is it a uh, boss? The blue, the boss. The CE2? Yeah, CE2, yeah. CE2, yeah. yeah. Old school. Wow. You know? That's amazing. And, um, you know, so... The song's in the key of A, and then it goes to the sixth chord. And what I wanted to do is like I, I just I I just felt that make playing a minor eleven there yeah. instead of just playing a stock, you yeah. know, go to the sixth chord was just like kind of boring yeah. and kind of like rudimentary and academic, you know. So yeah. I want to do something, you know, uh, you know, off the beaten path. So I put the minor eleven with the with the B and the E string ringing out, yeah, with a little bit of that chorus and and, and that shimmer oh, and maybe man. some delays, and it just like. It just created a spread there that really, really worked. And in some ways, I love that part so much. I, it's lo- like I the- love it too. It, it, it's the perfect setup for the chorus. It's like the perfect transition that brings it in. As I, I think I said this to you earlier. It's like a vignette around yeah, that little, yeah. that, just, that just brings your, your ears into what's about to happen in the chorus. Can we hear you play some of this stuff? Will you play like those different parts for us? Yeah, you want to start out with the crunch thing? Yeah, let's let's start with the crunch thing and then maybe we can hear the, the solo section and then also like the clean guitar section sure. where, where sure. it goes into the, the chorus. You bet. All right, let's do it. Absolutely astonished of like all the cool guitar parts on this, like all the stuff that you played. I want to continue with the Robert Palmer stuff and move on to Heavy Nova, which was 1988. 88, yes. And that had Simply Irresistible, huge hit, which yeah. you also played on. Yep. What can you tell us about what is remarkable about that session? Anything that, that you remember? Any stories? Anything that you could tell us about the gear? I'd well, love to hear that. The Riptide album was done on the Sony 24 digital machine okay. that they flew down to Compass Point. Okay. Uh, Heavy Nova was done uh, Dolby SR. Okay. And um, so it was. We're dealing more in the analog uh, mm-hmm. tape, the two-inch stuff, and and stuff. And it was cool. I I didn't care for the SR Dolby um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, sound too much, uh, but I think the body of work on that record is just incredible. And yeah. we cut that in Italy, uh, you know, um, at Studio Logic. Okay. in Milan. 
and uh, it was it was so much fun. Yeah, it was so much fun. It was a whole different thing for me. I had a JCM 800 that was modified by Harry Colby, and I did some slaving with that, you know. But that album really covered a lot of different styles mm -hmm. for me uh, as a guitarist. I mean, I was playing arch tops, I was playing flat tops. Uh, I was playing a uh, 12 string. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a 12 string on Simply Irresistible, believe it or not, but played through like- Acoustic? No, no, uh, an electric through through the rig. Wow. And it was like massive. So it's all part of that whole big, you know, wall of sound thing, you know, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do. Um, Riptide was done live ostensibly. There were a couple of things that they used St. Clavier on, okay. but, and uh, um, Simply Irresistible, the track was pretty much like the stem that we have. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, and uh, you know, with that uh, sampled guitar thing at the top, mm -hmm. and I just went to went to work on that, and uh, really happy with, you know, with the approach and how it came out. Um, I just heard the parts, man. It's like it's it's really something. Uh, you know, it's I don't know what you know. I mean, there's a certain antenna that you have when you hear yeah. something, you know, and it's all about hearing. Absolutely. You know, and uh, you know, if if you hear stuff and you you can you can put down what you hear. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's, you really cut to the chase. Yeah. And uh, there's so many schools of thought on that. You know? Sure. You know, I've been to sessions, I've done sessions where, where I heard immediately the part. Yeah. And the producer says, no, no, let's try this, let's try that. So three hours later, four hours later, you play the first thing, you, that's it! Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. first thing that yeah. you played. And it just takes, sometimes the process is securitous. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's a, yeah. it's a big circle. You wind up where it's, you're supposed to be. Yeah. Well, I've always said, you know, in, in other interviews that I've done with other session greats like you, that, that you know, you guys are, are, are such undercredited arrangers because you are, are essentially arranging on the spot to make the song whatever it is. And a lot of times these chord charts or these songs are, skeletons and what becomes part of the hook is invariably things that yeah. you know, you've come up with. And so I think that that I is think for all these thing. songs that we're playing today, I don't think there were charts on anything. Yeah, it was just it was just the, the band feeling it in the context of, yeah. or, or in this case, a track that was already- The, the track and you know, you, you either, you learn it or you just write, you know, uh, like a, a flow chart, yeah. you know, in terms of where the kicks are and, and all that and, you know. What was the gear on this song that you used, other than the the Marshall? What was the guitar or pedals or rack gear? Uh, the, um, the gear was uh, Grover Jackson gave me one really uh, um, a very early dinky soloist uh -huh. in BMW Orange, and I think there were three of those guitars made, and Jeff Beck had one. I think okay. there's single coils in his. Okay. And a very good friend of mine, John McCurry, had one as well. Okay. And a, a great uh, player in New York studio musician, okay. and then I had one with single, single hum configuration with the okay. Floyd Rose. I'd never had a guitar with a Floyd Rose before. Okay. And, uh, you know, the compound radius thing, it was like, it was like a, a Ferrari. Right. You know what I mean? So it was a real, it was a whole different learning curve. You know, it just made things so easy. It was like almost too easy because, you know, I'm, I'm playing Strats ostensibly, you yeah. know, or uh, an occasional Gibson. Yeah. But it was like, it was like a hot rod. Okay. So and it, it was so much fun. It was really a lot of fun. I bet. I mean, having the Floyd Rose and, you know, once you got this dialed in, you can yeah. really go crazy. Yeah, the first track I used uh, uh, it on was um, a, a track on the Riptide album called Discipline of Love. Okay. And which is a killer, funky ass track. And uh, and then I used it on on uh, Simply. And, and did you use any pedals or any processing stuff on that? Um, no, I, it was, I had a um, JCM 800 modified by Harry and uh, Harry Colby, and then it went into this box that he had that turned speaker level to line level. Okay. And then we slaved some uh, Yamaha power amp. I don't even know if it was tube or transistor. I, I okay. don't remember. Okay. And we had just a bevy of four by 12s in the room, and it was just like so freaking enormous. Wow. You know, it was it was so much fun. You wow. Know? Well, what, what guitar do you want to try this with? I want to hear how, what you were doing. Yeah, I've got something with single, single hum uh, Sir guitar that, uh, All right. that I want to use on this. All right, let's hear it.
so we did some great stuff with Robert Palmer here. You played amazing. It oh, felt thanks. like I was in the uh, the original session with uh, <laughs> with with you and, and Robert Palmer and the band. But I want to move on to I think arguably one of Steve Winwood's best records of all time. Uh, certainly one of my favorites. Back in the High Life, and that was eighty eighty six. Yeah, it was 86. Although maybe oh, no, the no, session was before no, that. It was before that. Um, it was uh, either early 86 or late 85. Okay. It could have, you know, it could have been maybe around August of 85 or something like that. Okay. And uh, it was a fast session, you know, and, um, and uh, I, I remember that day I was also recording with a great Japanese artist by the name of Akiko Yano. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was fun. Jason was uh, engineering and working with uh, Russ Teitelman, uh -huh. which is always a, a joy. And uh, he's he's a very meticulous kind of producer. He's a real song guy too. Uh -huh. And um, and uh, you know, it's like uh, I just know what he likes. Yeah. You know, he likes that kind of slinky stuff. It's like I think at a, there were certain uh, producers that I work with, which some was just wanted the big stuff, the yeah. big, big sounds. Like yeah. when I work with Jim Steinman on Bad Out of Hell 2 yeah. and all that, you know, those were really enormous big sounds and big productions. And when I work with Ross, it was kind of like more inside. Yeah. It was more inside and it was kind of cool. I really loved wearing both of those hats. Yeah. You know, it just made things interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and also when, you, when you're playing stuff that's inside, it's, you, you, you get to understand composition a bit more. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of, how you're applying your theory to what yeah. you're doing. How did you get the call for that? Because there's, there's, I mean, so many heavy hitter musicians on that. Um, Joe Walsh is on one of the songs that you played on. Nile Rogers is on yeah. one. Of course, you have the the great drummer, uh, JR. Oh, yeah, JR. <laughs> just, just, oh, just, man. just, you know, ha has some incredible drum sounds on, on, on this yeah. album. Um, yeah, how did, how did you get the call for this? Uh, Russ's office called me up. I forget who called. Somebody from his office uh -huh. called up and asked me if I was available. Uh -huh. And uh, I know my. I think I worked with him on a thing for Crush Groove. Okay. A track with Shaka. Okay. You know, and um, and he called me up and you know just did what I did. Yeah. And that was Studio C, at Power Station. Wow. There was a on a. There was. A, they still have the SSL back in those days. Okay. You know, and wow. uh, so it was, it was cool. And what was the what was the gear? I guess we should start. We should we should start first with Higher Love. Uh, yeah. What what was the what was like the session like? What was the gear that you used on on Higher Love? Higher Love was that Red Strat that I used on Addicted. Okay, the one with the EMGs. Yeah, the, with the EMGs. Okay. And DI. 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 No, no effects. No, no compression. Uh, uh, I'm I'm sure that maybe compression was uh, used afterwards and stuff okay. like that, or maybe in the process of recording. Okay. Uh, but you know when you're working with Jason Corsaro and I think Roy. Roy Hendrickson was also might have been engineering or assisting uh -huh. that day, and he's he's become an enormously successful right. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, engineer, and um, so I, I'm I'm sure that stuff was done you know post yeah you know and was Steve in the room when this stuff is is happening? Yeah, or? Steve was around, and um, uh, the, the there were reference vocals, and I'm saying these are reference vocals. It was just so freaking uh -huh. great. So like the lyrics maybe weren't fully sussed out at that point, or or was it? I heard the lyrics. There was a lot of stuff. Um, Joe Walsh's guitar wasn't on yet on um, on uh, Freedom Overspill, yeah. and Nile's guitar wasn't because uh, on Higher Love it's it's like ninety percent Nile, but I play in these different sections, uh -huh. you know, uh, which, which is so much fun. Yeah, you know, and um, and and so yeah, so Freedom Overspill. Uh, you know, it's really interesting thinking about. I don't know if you want to talk about freedom over spill now. Well, or, let's, we, we can yeah, talk. We, yeah. we, we can go between. We can go between both of them. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about the freedom over spill. My approach was is was minimal, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I at that stage of the recording wasn't fully realized. Yeah. So uh, my instinct was to really be precise and not to be too busy. Yeah. You know, and kind of pick your pick your spots. Right. And. Um, and for Freedom Overspill, I think what I played was really, you know, it's really funny hindsight, you know, and I think my instincts were right mm -hmm. because I had no idea that, you know, Joe was going to play all this incredible right. slide guitar right. on that. Right. And so his, his presence is really strong there. And my, my thing is like right in the center. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the, the, it's kind of like a part that, you know, you don't know it's there, but right. when it's not there, you realize that it needs right. to be there. Right. And to me, that's, 
kind of like that's that inside the track kind of thing yeah. that's kind of magical. You can't put your finger on it. Right. It's really so simple. You know, higher love is a different thing. That thing in the in the inside is really kind of like, I don't know what I was thinking, but it's that sounds good. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it was like when you were playing this stuff, was like Steve giving you feedback, like I like this, or was it was he kind of leaving that more to like the producers or the engineers to sort of guide that stuff? Steve was Steve was cool. He, um, I don't recall him opining much. Okay. Um, uh, Russ would say, uh, you know, maybe some things, but he was, you know, I knew when Russ smiles, you know, the, right. you know, it's it's he wants that smelly, yeah. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, and. Uh, so, and that, that was it. That was the barometer. Wow. Well, I want to hear some of this stuff. Can we maybe start with Higher Love and then and then we can go to Freedom Over Spill? Yeah. And, and for this, would we be using your, your uh, Strat? Uh, or yeah, yeah, I've got okay. a, a hardtail um, okay. non-trem Strat. That's uh, it. It actually is way more complicated than than you think. You're you're in there. You're doing all these fills. You got Nile Rodgers also like kind oh, of doing yeah, all these different. Yeah, layers. trying to do the Nile rhythm thing, which is inimitable. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's 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 a great DI tone. It cuts so well, and it and it's actually like a pretty funky a funkier guitar part than you might think for a, a Steve Winwood song. You know, it's just like yeah. You know, it's like looking back on it. It's really funny. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what my mindset was that day. Yeah, you know what I mean. But it's one of those things that just happens, and and just I knew that Russ dug it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, so that that's cool. And here in Nile, because I didn't, I, Nile didn't hadn't played on it. Right. You know, so he played on after I did. You know, right. and what he did was great. And he's one of my oldest friends. Yeah, we went to high school together. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it sounds incredible, and and I, I love the parts. I love just like as you said earlier about kind of just like staying in the middle and and it gives the space to be able to add on somebody like a Nile Rodgers or in the case of uh, Freedom Overspill, you have, you know, that space yeah, for yeah. Joe Walsh. And speaking of Freedom Overspill, I want to hear some of what you did on that one as well. So if oh, we yeah, can sure. move into that, are we going to stick with the same guitar on this one? Yeah, same All guitar. Right. All right, let's hear a little bit of what you did on that one. Yeah. spent some time on Robert Palmer. We spent some time with Steve Winwood, but I want to move into uh, something that is dissimilar to both of those artists in Run DMC. Mm -hmm. Now, Guitar World had voted you the most influential guitar player in hip hop history based on the work that you've done with Run DMC. And for those of you out there that don't know sort of the history, I think a lot of people uh, tend to believe that maybe the the you know the impetus or the the emanating music that that started sort of the crossover between rock and hip hop was with Run DMC and Aerosmith. But actually, there were two songs that were sort of precursors to that, which you both played on in King of Rock and Rock Box, that sort of. They, they both happened, I think, what, two in one year before there was ever any collaboration with Aerosmith. Yeah. And these were super important songs. They were the first people to really use rock and roll in hip hop. You're playing face melting solos, really gritty rhythm guitar. How did you come to get the call from Run DMC to start putting rock music? I mean, they could have called anybody at yeah. that point. Why'd they choose you? How did you get to know them? Well, the composer and producer, Larry Smith, 
uh, who's no longer with us, who's a dear friend of mine. We played in bands with uh, Denzel Miller and Omar Hakim when we were kids, starting mm -hmm. out. And you know, there comes a point where there's a juncture, there's a, a split in the road where you know you go one way, and you know, you know, musicians are they they have their own kind of separate paths. Mm -hmm. And when you when you make good friends as musicians, it doesn't matter where those roads may lead you. When you see them again, it's like man, you didn't miss a miss a beat. Yeah. So Larry kind of really kind of gravitated towards what was happening in the street. Yep. You know, relative to hip hop. Yep. And uh, the Bronx, where yep. I'm from. Yep. You know, and he immersed himself in that, and uh, and he was a bassist. Yep. And he was a good musician, and uh, he applied what he did to what he learned, and so you know he called me up and says, "Hey, man, Eddie, you know, you know, uh, I want you to put some of this rock, sh yeah, <laughs> on, on these on these tracks that I'm working yeah. on." So I went down to Green Street Recorders, and uh, Roddy Yui was the uh, was the uh, the engineer, and he was great. He did a great job on it, and I was just a boss OD one or OD1, whatever. So two knobs in the truth. <laughs> two yeah. knobs in the truth, and yeah. you know, into a music man with two twelves, wow. and got these big chewy sounds. And we layered a lot of guitars to get that tape compression going uh -huh. on, uh -huh. and uh, and. Um, uh, the harmonies that I did, kind yep. of like, uh, you know, I was thinking Brian May, you know, like yeah. stack up like four tracks of the tonic and one of, you know, going yeah. up to the third or whatever it was and, and uh, you know, get that thick yeah. tape compression harmony, yeah, you know. It really does kind of have that like, like Queen sort of solo tone, yeah, right, when, yeah. you, when he has the harmonies in there, that, absolutely. Uh, and that would, that would be on, on uh, Rockbox. Right? That was Rockbox, yeah. correct. Uh, for King of Rock, I think there was a Sound City amp or something or... or mm. uh, a uh, head in a cabin, and I think I used that. And that had kind of like more of a um, uh, upper mid kind of crunch thing going on. I think that really served the track yeah, well. You know, it was a bit more bite. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not as much gain as on the yeah. on on, uh, on Rockbox, but it, it was an appropriate kind of texture. Yeah, yeah, it almost sounded like Marshley, but I mean, the Sound yeah. City has some some relationship, I guess. To yes, kind of like yes, exactly, exactly. Sound. Uh, and, and on that one, was there any pedals or was it just strictly the, the amplifier? I think it was that same OD1. Okay. I, into OD1. the front of it. You know, because I kind of like with Marshalls, uh, I like getting them just to the breakup point. Right. You know, it's kind of like clean, clean right. crunch, that little right. kind of fine space. Right. That, that demilitarized zone. <laughs> right, right. You know, of tone. Right. And then you kick a pedal to push it up over the top yeah. and you have more flexibility and control. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's what I was primarily doing. Yeah. You know? I love it. So, in in guitar wise, what were you using on on those? That that red hammer that I used on Addicted. Okay. To love is. Yeah, what and that I was used. also what was in the video, right? Uh, yeah, in both of those videos. Yeah. 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 And, Iconic uh, videos with you on top of the Cadillac. <laughs> that was Larry's <laughs> Cadillac. Yeah. We did that at Dance Terry in New York, and it was just. I mean, I, I had no idea. I had no idea the significance. Were of, people coming up to you on the street and being like, "Hey, were you the guy?" <laughs> I, I remember Steve Stevens calling me up and leaving me a voicemail. He told me he was in London and it was blowing up over there. And he says, man, is that you? It's, you know, killing and stuff like that. And, you know, hearing that from a, a you know, contemporary is just really, right. just really cool. Yeah, it's absolutely. Really cool, you know? Absolutely. Well, can we can we do a guitar change here? And maybe we'll yeah. start with uh, with Rockbox. And, yeah, and yeah. Then, and then we'll move to uh, King of Rock. Yep. All right, let's you do bet. it. Those harmonies are insanely good. Like I never put it together when I heard that song that, that it would be going for a Brian May thing. But then when you say it and then I hear it, it, it completely makes sense. I wonder even if like Run DMC like was even aware of that connection of like what you were going for. Were they in the studio with you? Um, yes and no. At the beginning of the session, <laughs> they were there. Okay. They split. They came back like, I don't know, four hours later, five hours <laughs> later, and I'd put all these mammoth guitars on yeah. and all the riffs, and it was just like really kind of like, so basically I gave them so much stuff that, you know, Larry, whatever he was mixing, it's just like, okay, edit, mute, you know, so yeah. it's, it, it became right. like a, a, um, a mosaic of right. him punching things in and out. So when the guys came back, I think they were, ex 
they, they didn't know what they were expecting. And, and, you know, I did a documentary about it. And, you know, they alluded to the fact that, you know, they, they didn't get it. You know, but once that thing blew up, they got it. Right. Yeah, they, they got it all right. <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm, I'm happy about that, you know. Well, and, and they liked you enough that they, uh, you know, offered for you to come back a year later in 1985. Yeah. And, and, you, and you did uh, King of Rock. So what did that session look like comparatively? Was it the same sort of thing or were they there? Were they gone? Or- I- I remember them more from the first time, but I, I, I do believe that they were there for, the, for King of Rock when I put the guitars on. And, and Rick Rubin was there too. I, I, I never <laughs> yeah. met him before. He was there. He was in the studio, but I don't, I don't believe he was participating in production. I think he was okay. just like really kind of like just yeah. hanging. Yeah. And uh, I haven't seen him since then. It's been okay. all these years. It's all incredible. Right. And, um, and man, it was just, it, it was like magic again. Yeah. You know, it was just like, you know, Larry just, you know, when I got to the studio, it's like, a, as with uh, with a rock box, it was a DMX drum machine yep. and that keyboard, yep. you know, and Larry's bass. Yeah. And that was, it was just built off of, of that. You yeah. Know? So it was Spartan when I would get there, you know, it was just beats and a, and a, and a bass line. All right. Well, which was great. Yeah. You know, it's like kind of like, oh man, I've got all this room. I just felt like a mad scientist. Yeah. You know? I love it. Well, and, and those are some iconic guitar tones. And again, as I said, they really paved the way for what, you know, came to be the, the collaboration with Aerosmith, which, you know, again, I think a lot of people may be uh, not realizing and un- d- don't understand that there was all these great rock tones that were in, you know, earlier D- you know, yeah. DMC stuff because they just maybe weren't as into hip hop at the time or, you know, whatever the reason may be. But I can't wait to hear you play this. This is a great riff too. Just so thick and meaty. And, you know, I, I always thought it was a Marshall, so I'm glad that yeah. now it's clarified. <laughs> yeah. It's a sound city. Um, can you play a little bit of this for us? Yeah, please? sure. All right. Incredible. Now, there's one last thing that I want to ask you about before okay. we complete today. Okay. So there are some really cool old magazine advertisements and photos that I found of you back when you were in sort of the peak of your session and touring career. I okay. want to show you a few of these photos, and I want you to tell us a little bit of the story or the context behind them so that we can kind of hear it again from you about uh, what was going on here. Oh, you- sure. All right, Eddie. So first one is uh, you sitting on top of uh, two Marshall 4x12s with a, uh, a Marshall JMP head. Yep. Do you remember this? I do. I remember that photo session, and the photographer is Yvette Roberts, who's a dear friend, very, you know, acclaimed uh, rock uh, photographer. That was done when I, I, you know, I signed up with with Marshall, and I was just so, I was so happy to be a part of that you know, family, uh-huh. you know, and uh, Mitch Colby was there uh, in those days. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And um, and we, we you know, went to a studio and we shot those photographs and it was just great fun. It was great fun. It was a great association. <laughs> those amps really, they powered, you know, uh, the Robert Palmer stuff. It yeah. was just really, you know, uh, really an incredible time, an incredible time. The 80s were crazy, but it was fun. And it was the, the culmination of a lot of, of, of hard work you know, and um, paying your dues as you're going up the ranks and all yeah. that stuff. And it was really kind of, it, it, things came into fruition there. There was a really incredible time. Because my daughter was born around that time, you know, just like, the, just, you know, all these incredible things yeah. and blessings, you know, yeah. were happening. And uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, looking back on it, I, it's so funny. It, I, I, I tell people that, you know, when you're in, you, you're, you're so focused on what you're doing, you're not thinking about, I wasn't thinking about the historical aspect of any of this stuff. Yeah. I was just, you know, okay, 
uh, it was like, okay, man, I, I just love doing this. Yeah. And I wanted to play on records. I didn't want to play in clubs endlessly. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, being in the top 40 band, just doing covers and yeah. stuff like that. I wanted to play on records. And, you know, if I was lucky, I'd have other guitar players playing what I played. Yeah. And um, that dream and that drive, you know, in Spanish there's a word called ganas. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like... Um, desire, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, the desire to want to accomplish yeah. something. And, yeah. um, and uh, you know, I just put my, I just, man, I had blindfold, yeah. blinders on, blindfolders yeah. on. I was just like straight yeah. ahead. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so now yeah. I could, you know, as, as I was, you know, when we were in my, my, my music room, you know, and it's the first time that I've put those records up, you know, because yeah. I, I wasn't thinking in that context, yeah. you know, and uh, so uh, interesting. Yeah. All right, you ready for the next one? Yes. All right, next one is uh, here. Here you are, Martial Law. <laughs> yes. Side by side, uh, Eric Johnson. Uh, now, I, I presume that these are just superimposed photos. Yeah, they were superimposed. Not and... that Eric Johnson was on the other side of the Marshall stack. No, I mean just sharing the cover with someone that is that iconic of a guitarist. I mean, I I first heard Eric in 1976. Uh -huh. A friend of mine. Uh, I played a cassette. Okay. Uh, uh, and I was I was blown away in '76. Yeah. And then so like when what um, the Tones album came out and yeah. was that '85 or '86? Yeah, but even earlier than that, like I'm, I think the first big album he played on, which wasn't his, was Christopher Cross. Oh yeah. A, yeah. Minstrel Gigolo was the name of the song. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, so needless to say, you know, I'm so, I've never had the chance to meet him. But I, would, I look forward to the day that if I do meet him, to shake his hand, because he's such an incredible contributor to, to what we do. And I noticed you got the checkered Vans on there. Yeah, and, man. And, and it looks like the same guitar that you're holding here. Right yes, now. yes. Yeah. I got those kicks at the Trash and Vaudeville. Oh, you wow. Know, on, on, uh, uh, was on, in the village, East Village. Yeah. All right, the last photo that I have for you is you and Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, both in red shirts. Yes. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan is sleeveless, of course. Yes. And it looks like he's talking to you about guitars. Do you, do you remember I, I what do. he was talking to you about here? I do remember. You, it's, the interesting with, uh, story behind this is that I remember Chuck Pullen, who was a billboard photographer, uh -huh. legendary, right? And I, 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 I got to know him from being at different gigs and stuff like that. And I lost touch with him, but I do remember him taking photographs. And I called Yvette Roberts, the photographer that I was just talking to you about in the previous photo. I says, you know, do you know Chuck Pullen? He says, oh, yeah, he's really one, one of my dearest friends. She gave me his number. I called him up. And this has got to be around 84, maybe, 85. Mm -hmm. And I called him up and he says, you know, Eddie, he was still in the analog world. He didn't digitize any of his things mm -hmm. uh, back then. This is about maybe eight, nine years ago. Okay. You know, and he says, let me go into my into my workroom and see. And, and, and he... He reached out to me. He said, "Eddie, I found I found a slide of you and Stevie Ray, and uh, he says I'll send it to you, but please send it back to me. Mm -hmm. You know." So he sent sent it back. He sent it to me. I made copies of it and I sent it back to him. Mm -hmm. And I was just wow. That photo was taken at at a um, a show that uh, Stevie was performing. Buddy Guy was also performing. Clarence Clemens was performing amongst uh -huh. other people. And um, I knew some of the people that were playing. I was supposed to sit in, but I never got to sit in. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I'd been to a rehearsal, man. It's like trippy, this rehearsal. It was like Getty Lee was there. Alex Lifeson was there. Wow. Buddy Guy was there. And I told you about, you know, uh, Mac playing the, the, the Hamer guitar that was shaped like a tennis racket. Right. Because this was, this was an event that was put on by Mac and Rowe. Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. So it was there. And so I brought my 58 Strat there. So um, I was able to get in to say hello to him. So I showed him my white Strat. Uh -huh. and, and I thought there was a photograph of, uh, of us looking at that guitar, but uh, there wasn't one. But there was one of, of, of him showing me his guitars in his rack and nice. uh, yeah i got to play his number one at a at a bowie rehearsal one time wow and that was what was it like it was it was like i was trying to bend railroad tracks man there was like 13s on there and uh do you remember whether it was heavy or light or just normal or it seemed it, it did it wasn't extraordinarily light i wouldn't say it was heavy i would say it was like right around the weight of my my 65 that i yeah you okay. know yeah, so something around mid, seven mid sevens, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. okay and um so, uh, and I'd gotten to know him at Power Station 
because I remember when the Bowie album was being made and all my friends played on it, Omar and Bernard, uh, my, man, Bernard Edwards, I can't even begin to tell you, you yeah. know, uh, his contribution to my career yeah. and my success. He yeah. was really a mentor and a great producer. Really just his instincts were so profound. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all my sense of pocket was, was because of him mm -hmm. in terms of how he, he heard things and, and how things that felt good to him, I kind of understood where yeah. it, it sat. Yeah. And so that was really cool working with him. He's a dear friend, so missed. Yeah. And uh, so it was just an incredible time. Yeah. It was really amazing. So I, I'd, I'd known Stevie, met him a little bit, didn't really know him very well, but you know, he came in when I was making my, my, my first album with Bernard, um, uh, he came in to say hello and stuff. Yeah. And he was really kind of really nice cat. Yeah. Kind of quiet, demure, yeah. I would say. You know, a yeah. uh, really nice person. Yeah. Awesome, man. You know, amazing guitars. Well, thank you for, for uh, explaining those photos. And again, just you, the time today. And, and uh, thank you to the Hallowed Halls for having us here oh, yeah, in Portland, Justice Oregon. Phelps, Justin, uh, Justin Justice <laughs> Phelps. <Yeah. laughs> That's going to be his name. Does nickname. all the music justice. Yes, yes. exactly. Yep. Yeah, so thank you again, and, and just what, what a pleasure, Eddie. Uh, oh, I appreciate man, your friendship you. and just oh. everything you've done, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right.